Hello YouTube, I'm Vince White, I'm an employment attorney, and on this channel we answer publicly posted questions from YouTube users getting folks the answer they need from an employment attorney. Now, you're about to watch a collaboration I did with Lisa, the creator behind the Fight Employment Discrimination YouTube channel. If you have not seen her channel, it is tremendous. And I gotta follow my sword a little bit here. I, as you know, I'm an employment attorney. I'm not a journalist, I'm not a podcaster. I don't do this for a living. And I gotta be honest, in my conversation with Lisa, I failed her. Like, I, it was a great conversation. I think the content's tremendous. Her story, what she went through as a federal employee, as a victim of discrimination, um, I think it has, there's no question in my mind, it has tremendous value for tens of thousands of people. I think what she does on YouTube is rare and unique and so valuable. But I sucked. I sucked in this collaboration. Um, I didn't do a great job because it's not it's not what I do. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, the amazing thing was that she shined through. Anyways, I was so excited about this conversation, and I just feel like I let her down a little bit. But but she held up her end of the bargain, and I think she made up for my failings, and I loved it. But it occurred to me that I actually didn't do a great job of introducing her during our conversation. So I've got to create this right now, this introduction uh, video, um, kind of explaining what the conversation is, what the collaboration is, and um, that's what I just did. So I hope you enjoy our collaboration. I, I think uh, you have to respect her bravery. Um, she went part of the way representing herself and then worked with an attorney, and that's horrifying. Finding an attorney late in the game is so difficult. Representing yourself is so difficult. And she did it. And she won. It's amazing. It's an amazing story. Uh, it lifts my heart when I think about it. So, I hope you enjoy. Take care. All right. Number one, my first question. And this, this drives me nuts. As a plaintiff, what do you think about the claim that defense counsel and TV media personalities make that uh, plaintiffs are just in it for the money. <laughs> oh, I always have to laugh at that because um, I think there's easier ways to make money. <laughs> yeah, um, no question. I never understand that. And I and I have an acquaintance who goes on like the big cable news channels and she'll she'll go on and be like, oh, these women, they go out there to trap men and, and you know, in the, in the sexual har harassment context. And it's like, that is not a good way of turning any skill set into dollars. Like that is not, there are much better ways. Like I, this doesn't even make sense. I, I don't get it at all. It's very frustrating. I mean, it's not a sure thing by any stretch of the imagination. Um, yeah. And, and I don't know. I mean, I've talked to a lot of employees and mostly we just want the discrimination to stop. And a lot of us just kind of end up in this fight, not realizing that's where we're headed when we get started. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that's my experience. A lot of people come to me and they're like, listen, I need to fix this problem. And the heartbreaking thing that I have to say is, oh, we're probably not going to fix the problem. We can get you a check maybe, but these people are still going to be bad people. They're still yeah. going to, they're going to do these things. Like I can't fix the people. I can scare them. I can play whack-a-mole, you know, but I can't make them better. Yeah. The money is the consolation prize. So. Yeah. And that's always almost always what I see. And and the folks who come in as like a money-making enterprise, it's very uncomfortable for us. Like it, it's not, it's not the ideal plaintiff. And listen, they're due money. That's not the issue. But when somebody comes in, they're like, I got the case for you. We're going to make millions. It's like, <laughs> I don't know. You know, <laughs> it's not great. I'm sure you can see through people very well. So and in and, and my experience, investigators and AJs and all those people can kind of see where you're coming from. They, they're they pretty good at sussing out, you know, bad intentions, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. I think we all get a lot of repetitions, right? I mean, as a plaintiff, hopefully, hopefully you only get one ever, right? Right. But an investigator is getting 80 a year, maybe. I'm getting, I mean, in terms of our firm, 450 a year. Um yeah. Certain arbitrators, two a week, three a week, 
you know, I mean, they see a lot. So there's a lot of repetitions and you start to uh, build that, that ability to recognize, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. You start to see the patterns. Yeah. So this one is a little personal and I apologize. Um, you've mentioned on your channel, your PTSD from the events you experience. That's such a misunderstood cornerstone of our industry because it's a very common diagnosis, but society in the U.S., for whatever reason, doesn't understand the condition, doesn't understand what it feels like, wants to put it in the context of war all the time. And like we have it's it's very difficult. Do you want to talk a little bit about that or? I, I can try. Um, I guess what I can say about it is I don't. You know, I was a professional woman when this all happened to me, when it started, and I felt like I was a pretty capable professional person. I was accomplished. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that I'm on the other side, I kind of feel like all that happened to somebody else. Like, I don't feel like that person at all anymore. Oh. <laughs> um, so I'm very uncomfortable when I get into any situation that kind of reminds me of professional life. I'm just not, you know, this meeting was very very scary for me because um, I just flashed back to what it was like the last couple of years I was at NASA and, you know, those feelings, like I would go in every morning with my heart up in my throat here and um, wondering if today is going to be the day that something really terrible happens. And, and that still, that still comes up whenever I try to do anything professional. I mean, it took me forever to try to do the channel because um I, I had PTSD about doing computer work, you oh, know, wow. I was, and I mean, I'm a tech person. So, you know, I worked with computers. It was no big deal, but my boss took like the last year I was flipping charts for her PowerPoint charts. And that's mm -hmm. all that I got to do. And so when I broke free of there and retired, I never wanted to touch another computer. And it really wasn't until I started trying to do the channel that I pushed myself to do it, to, to try to use a computer again. And like, this is the first, collaboration meeting I've had because oh. I've kind of shied away from that. Um, it's because the panic attacks and then, and the, that feeling of my heart pounding up here, just because it reminds me of what it was like to be there. Understood. If this at any point isn't what you want or isn't comfortable, please just whatever, whatever's best for you. Um, I appreciate that. It's, did you have to litigate about your PTSD? Was there a pitched battle about the nature of your emotional damages? There was somewhat of a battle, um, but my therapist did a really, really good job of documenting where I was before all this happened. He was, I, you know, I've had depression for most of my life. I think I, oh. you probably know that I've said that on the channel. Yeah. Um, so I had a pre-existing depression when I started it was well controlled. It's been well controlled for 20 years, something like that, or had been when I started this. So he knew what my condition was going in. And um, so he did a really good job of documenting, like, here's what she's telling me they're doing to her. And here's the effect that I see on her. And uh, I don't know, my judge just took all that to heart. I, I think with the kind of damage that I had, though, um, what they did was so vile. That, that I don't think anybody would have had a hard time seeing that that would damage you severely. <laughs> and I've definitely seen that. We had a case early in my career where there was a there was a bet going on between the employees as to who could make uh, my client cry by lunch. And whoever could make my client cry by lunch would get free dessert, which it was all very clear retaliation. Um, and I remember that defense counsel basically just opted to not litigate her emotional damages at all just like in that context like bringing people back and it was a jury case bringing people back to that scenario and saying sure we had a bet to harm her every day for years but it wasn't that bad like they, they just opted out they were like listen it doesn't oh, make wow. sense like it's it's too dangerous for them and I, I can see that happening so it's interesting that you had so you were before a judge judges and arbitrators tend to have a better understanding of mental health and the damages associated with it. So you, you would not necessarily have had the pitched battle that we see a lot of the time about PTSD. We'll get people coming in, you know, jurors, and, and we don't know what they know. We don't know what their life has been. Um, 
besides what we get to do in jury selection. And we'll we'll have situations where defense counsel will say, like, oh, you have PTSD, like those people who lived in Seattle and saw 9-11 happen and they have PTSD. And it's like, oh, here we go. Like, okay, like, <laughs> listen, I'm not a doctor. I don't know if those people have PTSD or not, but that's not what happened here. And they're like, oh, okay, so is it like a soldier? Did you go to war? It's like. No, and actually, you know, um, I, I knew what PTSD was and or I thought I did. That was my idea of it. Um, I, I wasn't the one that came up with the PTSD diagnosis. And when my therapist came up with it, I was kind of like, oh, no, you know, that's so cliche. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, th I think what they did to me was so heinous that, that AJ didn't have any trouble seeing that, yeah, that would damage anybody. So, you know, he kind of shut down any discussion of that, really. I love that. I love that. We try to go through. It's kind of a. It's kind, I mean, I'm sure a doctor would tell, tell you I'm an idiot, but we try to go through like, hey, your adrenal and gland is firing all the time. You had bad things happen and now you're always on alert. And that seems to get a lot of traction with people who are new to the condition. Uh, we've had a lot of success with that, but it's always. um, Such a battle to convey. What people with PTSD are experiencing because first off there's a large spectrum but also um normies who don't have PTSD like they there's no ability to empathize we don't know right like I don't know what yeah. you feel before this collaboration oh I mean the panic attacks are terrible <laughs> you know the racing heart and the pounding chest and all that stuff it's just you know and you're not a scary person <laughs> you you're very easy. <laughs> I hope so. But you know, it's it's just being back in that mindset, you know, feeling feeling like I'm a professional again and feeling like I, you know, the person I used to be at NASA and and that panic just starts automatically. There's nothing I can do about it to stop it, you know. So uh I just try not to give in to the avoidance because I want to avoid it. <laughs> I want to avoid everything that I can that has anything to do with work, but I just don't give it to it. I don't allow myself to avoid it. I push myself because I don't want them to win that one. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I think I understand that fundamentally. Are you fully retired now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? You're so young. <laughs> Thank you, but no. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, my hat's off to you then. Tell me the secret. Um, speaking of the secret of... Uh, well, I guess self-care. Um, you you went through a protracted battle. Mm -hmm. You you must have had some kind of strategy for self-care, right? Like, how did you do it? Because not everybody makes it. Yeah, well, I mean, I panicked the day that my boss refused to discuss reasonable accommodation because I had a serious, serious problem. Um, and I literally didn't know how I was going to manage without it. I mean... So it hit me that I had to do something right away or I wouldn't make it. And in my case, I literally could have died because my pancreas was affected and stress exacerbated it. And pancreatitis was a real worry that my doctors had. And so I just looked at the process and we don't have any control over the process that, you know, the employers and the catbird seat there, they drive everything in the beginning. And I've figured, okay, well, I'm going to have to give myself up to whatever the process is. The part that I could manage was my physical stress. <laughs> um, so, you know, I did things like I had insomnia, so I would go to bed early so that I could still get decent sleep, even though I had the insomnia, hopefully. And, um, you know, I my problem was in my gut, so I had to deal with that, try to fix that. Um, the doctors didn't have a cure. So, um, Basically, I changed my lifestyle, my diet habits. You know, I <laughs> I ate raw vegan, um, which is not easy, but it I felt yeah. so good doing it that you know I just it was easy to keep up okay. and <laughs> and then uh, sleep. You know, the sleep and then exercise. You know, it's I'm a person who's driven, so like I, it's easy for me to go to the gym for two or three hours a day. Oh you know, wow! I get in that mode. <laughs> okay. But um, but I wear myself down when I do that. So, you know, my my mantra for going through this was just to get some gentle movement every day. And then another big thing was to um, 
tell to be careful of the things that I told myself about myself in my head. You know, we all oh. have this critical voice that goes in there. You know, you're you're stupid. You know, you're messing up. And and I just was really I didn't allow that. I just kind of interrupted that and said, no, we're we're going to be kind to ourselves. Um, and so, you know, I was I, I, I didn't kick myself. I learned to be kind to myself and do the best I could and let that be good enough. And what happened, happened. And then another big thing for me was work. Um, my boss, my boss took away all my good work, my engineering work, mm -hmm. um, and started giving me all this crap admin work. Yeah. And it really hit my self-esteem because, you know, you're professional, you're invested in your job. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt like I had been a part of NASA's mission, was really proud of that for 30 something years. Um, so when she took that away from me, it would really let me down. And I just I figured I got to do something about that. So I went out and found things that I could contribute, even though she wasn't giving me anything. Oh, wow. You know, I had a little bit of autonomy and I went and I used the autonomy that I had to to involve myself in helping some other people and helping with some projects that needed the help. And it made me feel useful again. And that was great. Amazing. So uh, when I was a kid, I read this science fiction book, which which I actually equate you with one of the characters in. Give me a little bit of a rope here, please. <laughs> it was some kind of like AI driven prison where these this group of people were thrown into it. And over the generations, they would slowly work their way out. And it was this horrifying, horrible prison jail. And the first character to get out couldn't go back in. The second mm -hmm. couldn't go back in. The third couldn't go back in. But somewhere along the line, like the 10th one to get out was able to go back and help others. And I do kind of think of you as that character because you made the channel. And I... I get the impression that sometimes the channel costs you in terms of wear and tear on, on your well-being. Is that, am I insane to think of you that way or? Um, I, I don't really see it that way. Okay. <laughs> um, if I could go back and just tell you a little something about me personally. Yeah, please. Um, I, I had a, a sister, one sister growing up, and it was a baby sister with Down syndrome. She had Down syndrome, and she had some physical issues, and she also had brain damage from a high fever when she was a baby. Wow. But she had a lot of challenges, and I just kind of grew up with a lot of responsibility for her, taking care of her and helping her. And then even when I was going through this at NASA, I was going to her workshops and her group homes and you oh, know, wow. throwing parties and helping out the staff and stuff like that. Um, it really took me out of my head. And so the channel kind of does the same thing. My sister's passed away now. She passed away, I think about a year ago. Oh. Thanks. Um, but the channel kind of gives me somebody to take care of, you know, some people to take care of, something to do so that I feel like I'm contributing and doing something to help somebody. That's beautiful. That's what I'm about. <laughs> I, I think, I mean, you are taking care of people. Like there's no one else that I'm aware of who offers what you offer. Like, I, I can tell you, hey, I've been there with people, but I've never been there, yeah. right? Like, I can say, hey, a lot of people tell me this, but, but I don't have a first-person knowledge, right? I, I yeah, I mean, you're empathetic, I'm sure. What? <laughs> and that helps. You're empathetic, I'm sure, and that helps. I have pretty low social <laughs> skills. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Like, <laughs> I, I, I can, I'm sure I've had clients who are like, What's wrong with this guy? Is he a robot? <laughs> like what? What? Other... No question. Um, and that's one of the weird things about our industry is that the people who choose to be in this industry more often than not are so conflict oriented that they're abrasive with clients. They're conflict oriented even with their clients. They're um, it's so intent on telling people like, you're going to take this. We're settling your case for this. It's like, hold on. My guy, you're not in charge. Like, this is not, this didn't happen to you. Um, and I think, I hope, I'm good. I'm good at putting the client in charge. I'm not good at um, the empathizing. I've never really had, I mean, I'm, I'm a white male. You know, I'm not really going to experience discrimination. Um, I don't. I mean, I don't know about that. People say the same thing about me being a white woman that, you know, I can't understand discrimination, I mean, but 
you they have, don't say that after they know my story. So yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree with you there. And listen, fully, fully on board. Caucasian people certainly can experience discrimination, and they can experience it. You know, on the basis of being Caucasian or ADA, you know, disability accommodation or age. There's there's a million and one different ways to experience discrimination. Mm -hmm. That's I just true. don't personally have much in the way of protected classes. Um, the only time I did, it's a brief spout of cancer, which I'm fine. And you just said, it just doesn't really count. Like I don't have the um, the full ability to to feel, I think, what my clients feel. And that's, um, it's good for me because I last longer, I think, in this field. The, the truly empathetic attorneys don't make 10 years. Really? I've noticed. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, that. listen, in a field where you can always go defense side and get a guaranteed huge paycheck and you don't have to talk to clients anymore, you know, it's tough. It, it, people do it. Um, but I, I digress. Uh, okay. Let's keep going here. So as you were pro se early on and you were pro se all the way up to summary judgment, correct? Yes. So I would love to know what strategies you employed all the way through, but especially in discovery. Because most attorneys will not take over a case from a pro se litigant that, that is that far along. Your case must have been in really good shape to get counsel. Yeah, it was. I mean, um, discovery was really kind of a nothing for me. <laughs> um, really? Because I, I gathered so much evidence along the way. Got it. Um, one of the things I was going to tell you about attorneys is, you know, I really think it would be good if you guys would just would just talk to us a few minutes when we hire you about what your strategy is going to be for the case and what we can give you that to help you win. Mm -hmm. uh, because my attorney, she was great, but, you know, she didn't do that. And, and, and you know, she wasn't in early enough to really do that. Yeah. With me. Um, so I gathered a lot of evidence that made no sense. I mean, I didn't need it. It was it was superfluous. It didn't prove really anything that I needed to prove. Uh, so I wasted a lot of time. But uh, my ROI was over a thousand pages, um, and I I was in a position. I was lucky. I was in a position where I could get access to pretty much any information that I needed, and so I did. You know. So discovery really was not much for me. And and witnesses were kind of the same deal. My witnesses were, I I had one witness, my husband, that wasn't NASA's witness. Wow. Yeah. Um, so to touch on what you mentioned about telling people what we're looking for, I can tell you really quick what we do. And I'm always, I'm always sure that we can improve it. Um, we do like an initial, somebody will call, they'll get the call center at first. The call center will be like, Essentially, just is this a claim in the field of employment law, right? Mm -hmm. And then they'll kick it to an intake person, and the intake person will talk with them and be like, "Okay, is this in the realm of something we might take?" And if if the answer is yes, then they kick it to an attorney. Mm -hmm. Then, generally, they're going to get half an hour free with an attorney here. That's a good consult. <laughs> uh, well, it's not actually. We don't actually consider it the consult. We call it a we call it a preliminary phone call. And then we either send resources, like we we create the videos, we create packets, we uh, we have a few stock letters that we can send to people. Like if you're applying for unemployment uh, in New York, because we can't do unemployment in other states, um, like we can with the discrimination, the sexual harassment, uh, we have some set things where we're like, okay, like here's here's the argument for constructive discharge, and we can just give that to people, you know, in writing. Um, nice. It it's. It's, I mean, it's it's good. It's good to help people. It's also, um, there's so much anger it, with from employees. Like, it's self-protective for us. People call us up and they're like, what do you mean you don't take unemployment? And it's like, oh, we actually can't afford to. Like, the state of New York will only let us charge $1,200 for an unemployment hearing. We only get paid if we win. And if we win, we actually wait nine to 15 months to get paid. So, like, wow. it, we can't afford to, right? Like, me, for me to put an attorney in the field for a day cost more than 1200 you know what I mean? That's so like, mean. it's just not like the state designed it so I couldn't, but no, nobody who's applying for unemployment wants to hear that. They don't care. It's not their job to care, right? So we started originally creating resources for people to be like, hey, 
it'd be awesome if you would not leave us like a one star review and tell everyone that we like murder children or whatever. Like we, we it was crazy. Um, and then. So, so we'll give resources if we can't help. We also give resources if we can help, but they're like, listen, we don't want to work with you. That's, that's fine too. Not a problem. Um, and we have kind of follow up where even if we're not going to end up scheduling a consultation, we'll be like, Hey, if you want us to answer questions about other firms retainer agreements, if you want us to answer questions for you, like you get uh, two follow-up calls guaranteed free, no strings attached, 15 minutes wow. a piece. Um, and, and, it people can definitely cut themselves out of that loop like there's a lot of people who get a little little fighty you know and then it's just like okay we're not going to help you anymore um i would have loved to have an attorney like you <laughs> i didn't i didn't get that from any of the ones i talked to <laughs> well we're in a weird we're in a weird position i think and, and there's there's a reason why some other firms aren't huge fans of the channel because i don't think they like we're like we're almost artificial in that we can do that stuff you know like we have the ability to do that stuff um and i don't think the average firm can necessarily like they can't have an attorney just sit on the phone for an entire day right or even two attorneys for an entire day yeah. i don't think it's cost effective for most people so i don't deride them for that but um assuming everything goes well on the first call we schedule a one-hour consultation um and then if you end up retaining the firm, we do an intake. And the intake is usually half a day. And it's going to be with a team of three attorneys. And the problem with the way we do it is people feel uh, a little too interrogated. Right? Um, which which is something I understand. I want the attorneys to get everything. Right? I, I want that. But I also want them to fundamentally recognize that a plaintiff has slowly regenerating well-being like it's it's a slowly regenerating resource so if you're like okay excited about the new case i as young attorney think i'm going to make lots of money on this case by helping you so i just need everything out of you right now like i understand that impulse but it doesn't have to be right now like we could we could do hour a day for a week that's fine you know like that that's a real issue that i've seen um we try to do handouts so people can come prepared that did not go particularly well. That no. created anxiety in the lead up. So it was almost harmful. I don't know. Can you, do you think of anything we could be improving on? I, there's gotta be something we can do better. No, honestly, I mean, when I hear you talk, I'm like, where were you? You know, I, just, I, mean, I, wish, I wish more attorneys would listen to you because they are so frustrating for the most part. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many people I know that just send the check and never hear from them until hey it's time for your summary judgment <laughs> and yeah that is, that's just a miserable place to be when you're you know we pay you guys big money big bucks because yes. it, for us it's big bucks because uh oh, we don't want to do this by ourselves and you know so it's really frustrating when we do that and we're still by ourselves so well, it sounds like you don't do that <laughs> well so we're very involved in the case and we do have a 24-hour callback guarantee but we definitely put up a fence like, hey, we are not your mental health professional. Like you, you've told us this story and we thank you for telling us that story. We can't listen to it again unless there's something new. And that yeah, has to be because like there's fundamental realities of time and space. Um, I assume. I don't I, I maybe see that as practice too, out. though. Yes. I mean, when you get to court, the judge is not gonna want to hear it over and over he's going to want to hear short simple you know facts <laughs> for the most part yeah and it's it's also it's weird but we have to get out some of the people always think like oh i need to cry in the stand it's like well probably not depending on the situation the jury probably that could come across as performative so we try to get it a little bit concise a little bit practiced and and in the practice, it can it can smooth over some of the difficulties sometimes, um, and it's not always possible. Obviously, you know, with what people I'll, I'll tell you, I didn't practice. My my attorney and I communicated about my story in writing. Like you know, she read things for the most part, and I didn't really tell her a lot about it. 
Um, and then I got into my hearing and my judge was asking all kinds of questions about, well, how did you feel and what did you do when that happened? And, you know, and it was the first time I'd ever talked about it in an and a sympathetic with a sympathetic person <laughs> he felt right. sympathetic you know he's impartial but he was trying to be understanding and um and i i broke down bawling and my attorney's like please dial it back dial it back dial it back but i couldn't help it so yeah that's a good idea I and mean, that sounds like it would have <laughs> been very compelling yeah. to, to me um also with you i don't think listen this is obviously i have um one of those weird interpersonal relationships with you, but you don't know me, but I watch your videos. So like, I have that sense of like, I feel like I know you, which I'm sure you That's get. Fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, but my impression is that you wouldn't cry if it wasn't really bad or you wouldn't be emotional in, in that setting if it wasn't really bad. So no, to me, no. that seems like it would be very compelling. 